be here today, and um, I'm going to talk about a, a uh, non-local fracture modeling, and uh, there are several communities which actually have been contributing to, to, to non-local theories of fracture mechanics, and I will, will outline uh, these uh, in, the, in the coming references here, uh, the, the participation of, the, of these different groups. Uh, as well as just the greater um, uh, question, scientific question of, of, of uh, fracture propagation, dynamic fracture propagation. Um, dynamic fracture propagation, uh, or if you will, free crack propagation is, is still open. I would, if I had to say, I would say you could think of this as uh, fluid mechanics back in the uh, 19th century or, or maybe even before that. Uh, so there's a lot of, of open room and theories, and, and, and there is a lot of uh, entrenched interests as well. Uh, but but the, I think uh, the, the, the theory and the field is going to be evolving quite a bit over the next several decades. Um, so the outline of this particular course, uh, the first lecture, I will give uh, motivation. Um, I'll give some physical and physics behind uh, some of the uh, ideas here. I will show some experiments. I was going to show an experiment quick time, but I have a static experiment. I, you, you'll see what it is. Um, then I'm going to do some applied mathematics uh, and, and develop a, a non-local uh, multi-scale uh, model. And uh, then I'll talk about localization theorems uh, and state them informally. Uh, next lecture, lecture two, I'll go ahead and, and present them more formally, as well as give an idea of the techniques. Unfortunately, to present the techniques in their proper form, I would need several lectures, but I'd be, you know, I'm here all month. Um, and uh, then lecture three, we'll do it a, a simulation, just an example, uh, of calibrating uh, these models to elastic properties and experiment. And then the bulk of the lecture We'll talk about the numerical analysis involved and uh, some convergence uh, theory uh, available already uh, to non-local modeling. So I'll talk about that and finish up on our third uh, lecture with some uh, comments and uh, remarks about the field. So uh, having said all that, uh, I want to impress upon you that uh, dynamic uh, fracture is, a, is very uh, multi-scale oriented. Uh, Basically, um, it acts across disparate length scales. Uh, here's an example of a cracked ship. And you see this is a macroscopic result. As the sailors would, would tell you, that they, 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 they have witnessed something here, obviously. And it started small and got big. So that, that's multi-scale. Uh, also, it happened quickly. Um, and uh, I won't talk so much about the temporal scales, but obviously these are very important. Unfortunately, I'm going to talk about spatial link scales today, but equally as important is the temporal link scale. Um, and in particular, we also have a mesoscale that is, is the flaw size. So typically, uh, materials don't, when they fracture, they do not fracture at energies uh, equal to their atomic bonds. If they did, it would be far too high of an energy. Um, you, w you wouldn't see anything fracture, okay? What occurs is there is a flaw size, and these flaw size have corners, and as we all know with L-shaped domains, we have stress concentrations. And as these stress concentrations, which apply, supply enough force to break atomic bonds, so we focus much like a, um, a lightning rod and dielectric breakdown, we have a breakdown of a material, but it's due to high field concentrators, in particular microscopic flaws with sharp edges, and so this was evidenced through experiment. They saw that glass did not break um, at forces required to break atomic bonds, but broke much, much quicker than that, much easier than that. And the ultimate I experimentally understood fact was is there are flaws which concentrate, which we all know, fields, and these concentrated fields are the ones that, that ultimately are strong enough to break the bonds. Uh, and then, of course, which crack turns into a macro macroscopic crack, or which flaw uh, starts a crack, but then the crack arrests. Very interesting. So, so very much a macroscopic uh, 
uh, multi-scale phenomena. Now, <laughs> unlike from the mathematics perspective, uh, Professor Inquist had shown us this beautiful uh, bow shock and then a turbulent wake. And in the turbulent wake, we saw a, 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 a kind of multi-scaling. And there was distributed like a periodic composite. So the period or the characteristic link scale or the um, correlation length was small relative to the body itself or the computational domain. And so, as Daniel had, had showed, you, you, you seek to understand, pick some link scale, and then seek to encode information about the distributed link scales below. Well, that was the uh, distributed, say, the uh, eddy regions or the, the turbulent wake. On the other hand, this fracture, what we're going to talk about today, is more of the sort of type A multiscaling of the, the shock. That is, there's a shock structure, and inside the shock, there is microstructure. And here, that's essentially what's going on. So we're going to do a type of multiscaling, but it will be spatial, and it will be localized, okay, not distributed. So we'd like to understand, <coughs> uh, through the dynamics, how, how uh, we, we localize okay, damage, or how we localize and create a crack here, as opposed to over here or over here. And our intuition pretty much tells us, well, where the biggest stresses are, we should find, find fractures, okay? All right, so th this is kind of note. This was to be a movie. Uh, it was going to show something like um, that, okay? You'd see a crack. And basically, let me describe the movie for you. You had a, a, a dog bone-shaped specimen, thin on one axis, a little wider on the other, ran along this way, and it had two clamps, and it started to pull, at a uniform speed. And what occurred was, watching the deformation field, it, it began to deform, and it was dynamic enough that you could see the deformation's waves propagate through. They, would just, they wouldn't scatter or anything, because it was quasi-static, essentially, so it was very slow, but you could see the displacements getting larger and larger, and ultimately the specimen failed, and the link scale of in the time was very quick. Okay, Very quick, and it, it failed through the through the, um, th the, the uh, width. So, in the, uh, so we had a long dog bone and it failed across that way. Now, it didn't fail in the middle. Okay? And again, that was be due to flaws in this particular brittle solid, which was a ceramic. So, flaws dictate, <coughs> or, or mesoscopic link scales can dictate where uh, a, a, a crack can orig or origin, or boundary conditions, a uh, notched. You put a notch in there like a lightning rod, only now it's a, uh, if you will, it's a, it's, it's now going to be a field concentration for a stress or a force, and you'll, you'll, you'll initiate a fracture. So <coughs> the classic uh, dynamic fracture theory has been tremendously successful, and uh, basically the, the crack is, is, is modeled as a, is a, is a branch cut, and then on either side of the domain you'd have a, an elastic solution. And um, basically, the, 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 the long and the short of it is the, the crack begins to run when uh, it releases more energy needed than creating new surface. So once you release more energy, you have to create a surface when you make a crack, so that requires some energy. But if you manage to release more energy than it costs to uh, <coughs> generate two surfaces or a surface, then you'll, the crack will run. So that was the idea. Okay, and it's been extremely successful and, and uh, has, has enabled engineering design of many things. In fact, they were able to get rid of this after, uh, you know, they, they got a proper theory going. <coughs> okay, so um <coughs> suppose we do know the uh, fracture path. So a priori, we know it's going to run along a straight edge. Then um, the classic top-down approach is you start with a PD away from the crack, and um, then in the in the neighborhood of the crack, you you provide a separate physics, okay, for the crack in the, in the in what they call the process zone. That's where the damage or the microscopic damage is taking place, and then you provide uh, separately then a uh, equation for the time evolution of the crack along the path. So this is a sharp fracture model, okay. One kind of physics away from the crack, elastic. Another kind of physics describing the damage process, and another kind of physics 
uh, describing or a phenomenological equation describing the uh, the trajectory or the, the the time evolution, the velocity of the crack, and it all boils down to a, a rational application of Newton's laws. So, if we, one wishes to dig deeper, this is an excellent monograph, uh, dynamic fracture mechanics, uh, and it's in paperback, and it's 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 very nice. Uh, applications of complex variables and uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Okay, so the applications <coughs> would, would basically benefit greatly if you have already a network of cracks and you'd like to know which one of these cracks is actually going to grow and break your sample. And <coughs> in, in part it's infrastructure that uh, derives, you know, drives this and in particular what's really driving it now why, why we're no longer satisfied with complex variable methods is that computation. Okay, we, computation is really now driving, uh, enabled and emboldened by computa computer methods. Uh, one is able to start trying to computationally understand or predict where fracture is, is going to happen. <coughs> so here, I, 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 this, is, this is just a thumbnail. But, but the main um, thing that has come out, uh, Xu and Needleman, um, is called a cohesive zone element. So you all know about finite elements. Well, in addition to um, the element you have at the, at the neighborhood between adjacent elements, you would also specify a surface element now, or, or a line element. And it would have some sort of uh, ability to, at some point, um, decohere and split. Now the problem with, with these early, early things were that they were very mesh independent. Okay, so depending on your mesh, then that would be the crack that you would see. And this of course is, and, and some people already may know this, is that in image processing, processing this is the same kind of thing. So a dependence, uh, you know, the image segmentation problem of Mumford and Shaw, for example. Okay, one, one, one wants to get around a, 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 a mesh dependence, a uh, discretization error due to that. So, <coughs> what really, what the real breakthrough was for mesh independence was what is called XFEM, Extended Finite Element Method, which is a partition of unity method, which, which people know about in, in here. And, and, and basically allowed for a local enrichment of the space, but at the same time, was able to uh, impart some, some degree of mesh independence on your computational model. And so this has been, you know, uh, I, I, unbelievable amounts of uh, work have, have been put into this. A lot of it, uh, it you know, pioneered by uh, Ted Belichko, this paper here by Belichko and Black, and using uh, partition of element, <laughs> partition of unity methods, <coughs> okay? So, uh, <laughs> and this has been very, very, very uh, interesting work. It, there's no underlying continuum theory, though. Okay? It's just a feel for the problem, and a good feel, but, but still no underlying continuum theory. So it's all a finite dimensional representation, and hopefully, you know, it's the right one. Okay? But, you know, the proof is in the pudding. If they can predict when a plane will crack or various things, then then we're okay. Unfortunately, Boeing still does not trust anybody to do it for them. Okay, they still have to break things and, 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 and over-engineer. Uh, now, top-down models also are, 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 are uh, what are called, well, they, they're now becoming called phase field models, and, and basically you have one field to model the elastic or, or the, the deformation, not the elastic, but a deformation field in the body, and a second field to model damage. So you have two fields. And so then the idea is, uh, and most of this is predicated on the Ambrosio-Tortorelli functional coming from image processing, uh, because it, 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 it uh, gamma converges, I don't know if People know that yet, but it gamma converges to uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics. But it has its own, that's one feature, but these, these folks, and, and what I'll show you today too, because what I'm going to show you is also based on some image processing insights. Um, these folks here uh, were able to, in a quasi-static way, uh, understand um, 
in a very brilliant way, understand uh, uh, fracture propagation using a, a, a two-field model. And then subsequently, uh, a dynamic version. Again, here, in this model, in addition to uh, they, they, they allow uh, for, for time or, or inertia to enter into the problem and um, look at softening elastic moduli. That's how they're going to model their, their, their partially, their, their, their degraded uh, elastic properties and then keep track of this again through a second field. Uh, I should mention here though, as I, as I had, this is really done quite well, what there's a problem with every theory, but one of, one of the problems with that one is that it allows something to break without any flaw involved, okay? And that does not happen. So you don't want to have a, a, a fracture start appearing when and there was no flaw and there's no reason for it to appear. But that's a, you know, they, they, everything has, you know, uh, but, but that's one thing. So we'd like to work that better. But as um, my friend Chris Larson, who's from WPI, would, would, would say is, is that basically we, what would be better is to have a good dynamic theory and then take the quasi-static limit or the ability of the quasi-static quasi limit to express reality uh, will probably be brought on by, by good dynamic models. And I, I am firm in, firmly in agreement with that. Um, then uh, we have uh, the uh, coupling of uh, porous media flow and a a fracture evolution and some really nice variational inequalities has, has come out of Mary Wheeler's group uh, for understanding uh, how um, you, you have a liquid in a crack and how that liquid creates more cracks. Okay, so this is also very, very um, uh, interesting. <coughs> now, we also have this sort of non-local formulation. Uh, there, there's no phase field. It's just one field, a deformation field. Uh, and, and then there's some sort of softening material property or breaking brittle material property. And uh, Stuart Silling came out with this in 2000 in, in JMPS. And it, 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 it hangs together. It's its own, uh, it's its own uh, continuum theory. Okay, so it's fine. It's self-consistent, um, and the amazing thing is, 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 is using um, um, numerical analysis, or not numerical analysis, numerical simulations. The simulations are spectacular. You can, it, it's, it's um, Pixar. You know, it's, it's just amazing. It, it just it works. You know, so maybe there's something to that. Okay. Um, and then also, uh, this has is, is been used by uh, Kaushik uh, Dayal and Kaushik Bhattacharya, uh, f uh, employed in, in, in the propagation of phase, uh, phase boundaries. Um, and in the lim linear paradynamic model, uh, you know, it, it has been shown well posed, okay? And today I'll show you another model which is nonlinear and, and, and has softening, which is also well posed. Um, <coughs> So then these folks here um, have done some very nice crack branching simulations and have come very close to reality, okay, in their, in their numerical experiments. Um, and then it's been uh, engineering sort of finite element applications. And then uh, <coughs> here, uh, Patrick Deal, uh, who's here, um, has, has done some recent work in, 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 in qualitative study of mode mode one crack opening. So there are many, many uh, simulations out there. And then <coughs> there's uh, bottom-up approaches. And so uh, a f an e example here, an older example, is that of uh, <coughs> Zdenek <Zidane> Bajant. <coughs> and they basically uh, showed how non-locality, you could use sort of heterogeneity to <coughs> engender non-locality at certain length scales. Uh, it's very formal, but uh, it, it does do one thing and actually gets a uh, sample size effect in, in, in quasi-brittle concrete, if you model concrete, and it gets it right, okay? And um, so this is a very interesting uh, thing. It captures the size effect of, uh, you know, when sample size on, 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 on strength, okay? Um, 
Now, uh, atomic link scales uh, through upscaling straight to uh, classical fracture mechanics energies are done by these uh, models of uh, uh, Brady's and Jelly, uh, Forcati, and uh, <coughs> these here are using, in some sense, and in, uh, in, in, in actually in many, initially for, for, for some of them, they've been using the, the insights of um, Massimo Gobino, uh, and, and, and his work in image processing, but subsequently for, for instead of uh, two-point forces or central forces, if they had multi-point forces, they have been uh, developing on their own uh, some very nice uh, discrete to continuum uh, deriving in the, as a gamma limit the uh, a linear elastic uh, fracture mechanics energies uh, using uh, various methods. And then Lev Truskanowski, um has uh, a posited uh, uh, fracture as a phase transition for uh, when you have a, um, a gradient or through a, con uh, a conventional uh, elastic material and, and you would have one well at the origin and one well at an infinity and depending on where your, your gradient would live in, a, in a, 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 a weak space so your gradient, would, or your, your gradient would actually have an absolutely continuous part with respect to Lebesgue measure in a singular part. The singular part is very nice. It has jump sets and these things try to distribute themselves in such a way that they are, are, are kind of uh, occupying different wells of an energy. Okay? And uh, so th this, these are all very interesting things. Um, and very interesting um, for large deformation non, uh, mechanics uh, and understanding crack, crack tip instabilities, you may know where the crack is going, but, but you don't know if it's going at a constant velocity or there are many velocities allowed for it or it may do multiple branching or initiate multiple branching. <coughs> Mike Martyr and um, uh, Gross uh, have um, really uh, uh, done a very nice work on, uh, on, uh, on the dynamics of uh, lattice models and the inherent discreteness uh, and, and of, so you already have some, by some means you already have a crack that's propagating. Now you ask yourself, is it stable or is it, does it want to branch? Are there certain velocities where you have stable pr propagation and once it exceeds another velocity, do you start to branch? Why is there a speed limit on the velocities of cracks? What is the origin for that? And in certain cases, these guys are able to uh, provide um, using uh, discrete models, some, some, some answers, okay? There's some plausible answers. And, and the same thing here with rubbers. <coughs> now, what, what I'm going to talk about today is sort of a, a non-local dynamics is a multi-scale model, okay? And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So I, first, I have to give you all the link scales involved, but that's the idea, okay? And... Um, there's some sort of lower, for a linearized theory, there's some sort of lower scale modeling um, where you could see paradynamics as an upscaling of a discrete model. Okay, and this is done here. Uh, for the linearized case, and there you have classical derivatives. Okay, so, so that's, that actually, and that is by no means a uh, complete description of, of the literature at all. Um, but it gives you a feel for various things that, that have been done. Um, still, Boeing or any aircraft manufacturer will not touch this stuff, okay? They'll, they'll do experiments and, <coughs> uh, and, 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 and uh, so, so more needs to be done. And we have computational power, so the question is, is how do we, you know, use our computers in a, in a rational way to deliver predictive fracture calculations? Um, so, towards this direction, there was a, um, this is the second uh, Sandia fracture challenge. Uh, well, actually, this is the second, and this is the third. There was a first that was never publicized. It was in-house. And then there was the, what they call the, the, the Sandia fracture challenge, the public one, the first public one, and then the second public one. And here's a picture from the first public one <coughs> of some samples they broke. So, so basically, they would take a sample, they would put a notch in it. The sample would either be made of, for, the fir for this fracture stat challenge, it was steel, martensitic steel. For this, uh, 
fracture challenge. It was titanium. Um, and they would put a notch in it. And then they would pull. But they would also put some interesting openings, brackets, if you will, these circles here. And you see there are various sizes. And they would put them there so you couldn't uh, postulate an analytic solution to the problem. You literally had to compute a solution to the problem. And the idea was, is when you did your computation, there were certain quantities of interest that are of interest to engineers, and they wanted to see if you could get these quantities of interest through your computation. Um, and so now I'll show you a quantity of interest. And basically, it's the crack opening displacement, okay, as the crack goes, as the crack begins, the crack opening displacement as a function of the force presented uh, on the, at the grips. So there's a certain force, there's a certain crack displacement, now the force increases, what does the crack displacement do? So I will show you some answers. So <coughs> <coughs> these are the um, experiments here, and these in gray were the first set of experiments, but they were a little bit off. <laughs> Somebody found a, 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 that uh, they, they actually weren't applying it correctly. There was some play in a bracket. Interestingly enough, uh, Ravi Chandar at UT, uh, through his simulations, figured out there was a play. <laughs> there was a problem in there. Experimental. He's pretty good. And so they did a second one in dark. <coughs> and so this is the second experimentally determined thing. Now, the other thing to notice here is there is some scatter. So what happens here? This is the crack opening displacement. And this is the force necessary to make that crack opening displacement. This, you can see many of these teams followed the experiment, and then one experiment dropped down. This is where all of a sudden uh, you basically lost, it didn't matter anymore. The, the thing broke. You could apply as much force as you want, it, it, and it was broken. Okay, so when you see something like this happen, when it falls off, it means here that it, the, the material itself is, is it, there's no force anymore. Okay, so it, it's just the material is not pushing back, okay? And so that would, so these are the forces, this is the force the material pushes back up to here, then that's it, material doesn't push back, and maybe it, you know, does something, maybe it pushes back a little bit, and then it really fails, okay? And then this is the other experiments. Now, you'll always see some experimental scatter, okay? Because the specimens are different, and there's specimen variability. So you, this is part of the game. <laughs> uh, now, here are various teams, okay? And you could see you know, some teams did better and some teams did worse. Uh, and now this is a ductile and it's also what are called uh, quasi-static loading, meaning that they pulled very slowly. There was no real inertia involved here. Now the second challenge <coughs> was carried out on titanium and it's very hard to see, but there the, the, these grayish lines here are what the experiments were doing. These grayish lines here. Now this first one was a quasi-static experiment. So not the effects of inertia were not being felt. Here they pulled much faster. And uh, you, you basically, uh, it was inertia was, was present. <coughs> and so various models fared differently depending on whether it was quasi-static or, or that. And okay, there was also, uh, uh, ductility involved in the quasi-static one, and less so here. So, so anyway, various teams did better, worse, um, and these are all published. Okay, this is all published. It's in the. Uh, I'll go back here. It's uh, published here in International Journal of Fracture, a very exhaustive uh, publication. Actually, this is open access. You could you could get it from home if you like. And, and then here's the other publication. And they go through very carefully, you know, the experimental setup. And then, then it also has the reports of the various teams, okay, explaining what their modeling approach and what they did and how they got it. And uh, they were also allowed to redo the experiments. Once they saw the experiment, they were then, so it was, du was double-blind. The experimentalists didn't see the computational uh, approaches. The computational approach didn't see the experiments. Everybody had uh, available properties for titanium, the particular titanium they used and the particular steel they used. 
available from the literature. Okay, so that's how they informed their their models was simply by available, uh, you know, uh, co constants and various elastic properties, fracture toughnesses, strengths available from the literature. So very very interesting. Uh, but still, we have uh, how do how do you c uh, basically given a damaged shear uh, panel, how much more da dynamic load could it sustain till failure? Uh, basically, you know, it loosely rephrased, you know, how much reinforcement needs to be used in engineering design of infrastructure, commercial aircraft, a specific stri strength because you have to lift them up and and, and burn fuel. So uh, can you reinforce for less and be just as confident? Um, and uh, insurance, it's it boils down to money, but but this is this is the idea. So what I'm going to talk about today is first I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the modeling and the applied math. Then I will, in a very informal way, talk about the uh, uh, sort of sharp interface limits, okay, but in an informal way, and show that these sharp interface limits are motivated by considerations given at the outset. Okay, so that's the important thing. You, you, you know, we, we, we don't want to postulate some math, do some math, and then it doesn't relate to anything. You, you kind of like to do the applied, you know, understand what you should be looking for and then do it, okay, as opposed to just doing something and, okay, we're, and because it's a new theory, you know, it's a new area. So that's the idea. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at unstable, unstable non-local dynamics. Uh, here, we're going to have a non convex, non-local two-point potential. I'll ex explain what that means. And we'll show <coughs> that uh, it, it localizes to something based on this sort of PD model and, and, and cracks, okay? So let's, let's uh <coughs> so basically we're going to assume that the non-locality goes to zero relative to the sample size and see what happens to this sort of mesoscopic evolution. <coughs> now we're going to do this within a, a, a paradynamic context and so it's really, you, you, many of you have seen molecular mechanics or, or, uh, or uh, dynamics, molecular dynamics and so you, you see similarities between these two approaches and basically uh, Dr. Stilling was, uh, he, he had been doing various fragmentation um, uh, computations using numerics and, and just figured, you know, this would be a better way to do it since uh, he didn't want to be burning. He, s he sat down for a year and, and figured out a nice self-consistent mechanics. And so it, it's, a, it's a very handy thing. So, so basically um, what we're going to do is we're going to postulate a Newton's law and um, we're going to say U will be the elastic displacement. Okay, so this will be uh, in, 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 in what we'll do in these lectures is small deformation theory so that the reference con configuration is the same as the deformed configuration. We're only looking at small deformations. Okay. Um, however, they could become discontinuous. <coughs> uh, so, so basically we take the de uh, displacement at X prime, U prime here, and we take the displacement at base point x, that's u, and we take their difference, divide them by the distance, and dot product them with the direction connecting these two, the unit vector. Okay, this is the dot product here. And so this is, this is what will be called the shear strain, the shear strain, okay, between these two points due to that deformation. Um, <coughs> for those of you that know SBD, um, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see some, this thing converging to something interesting, okay, <coughs> later on. Um, so this is, this is, uh, the, the, the directional, the strain along the direction E due to these points. And now <coughs> for that particular strain, we're going to introduce, <coughs> say, let's take a base point X and that'll be the center of this domain and this domain will be a ball centered at x of radius epsilon 
And what we're going to do is we're going to fix x. And this k here is the force associated with this strain between x and x prime. So we're only going to strain if there is a force. Okay? Or the force will be a function of the strain. So that's, that's how we do it. So we apply a force, a force between here and here, we'll get a strain. Or we apply a strain and we get a force. Okay, so we apply a strain and we get a force. <coughs> and then what we do is at that base point, we will sum over all uh, other points, x prime, in this neighborhood. And that will be the total force acting at the point x. And then we will say that the, um, we have an acceleration times a mass density. This will be the ma part of force equals ma. Okay, and so this will be the acceleration of the point at x. And it is proportion, it's equal to the net force integrated over x prime on this neighborhood here, plus a body force. There could be a body force, like gravity or something. Um, and in fact, what we will ultimately do is we will look at body forces localized to the boundary, and we will sort of imply that they are attractions or they're boundary forces. Okay. <coughs> and we can complement them with some boundary conditions as well, and I'll, I'll explain those. <coughs> but the non-locality now is the length scale of this horizon, or this interaction zone. So around each x, point x will act with points x prime only inside this horizon, only inside this ball. Points outside here, they will not interact with them. And this epsilon will be the, the uh, ratio of the size of the non-local interaction zone to the domain proper. Okay? Fine. We don't have any multiscaling just yet. We, we see we have epsilon and, yeah, things are different link scales. But this, this is the uh, bare bones paradynamic setup. Then in paradynamics, the, the bare bones, you go ahead and... Um, <coughs> you assume um, that the force, K, which depends on strain, S, increases with force. So as the force increases, the strain increases up till a point where the force stops and it, you break. You break the bond. And same way over here. Okay, so that's the bond breaking model. <coughs> now what we're going to do instead is if we just smooth out the bond breaking model. So this is where the bond would have broken before. We allow it to soften here. Okay, so this is our strain. This is our, our force K. And as a function of S, okay, it softens. But when we do that, we automatically get a lot of structure coming out. All of a sudden, we can now write the force as a derivative of a potential. Okay, a potential associated with x and x prime. So we, we have more information now. We actually have to, for each, inside the interaction zone, for each center point x, we specify a potential relating the two, x to x prime. Okay, and we take its derivative. Okay, and now let us look at what kind of potential we have. <coughs> we have... Here, I, uh, this is a busy slide, but I'll, I'll just say here's our, here's our force. It, it, it goes, it's elastic in this region here, and then it softens. Okay. And here is the potential. The potential as this function of strain has a well at the origin, and if you will, a well at infinity. Okay. So this is going to somehow represent surface energy, and this will represent linear, very close to here, will represent linear elastic energy, okay? So immediately we, 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 we get this structure. So then you could say, okay, fine, we, we, we could have a bond, you know, if X is here, and we have a little neighborhood around it, and maybe all its bonds are elastic. Or, or up here, actually. We have a neighborhood up here, and all its bonds are elastic, and that would be this. But points over here, in these lobes here, they 
would be uh, on the verge here of softening. Uh, you know, all the X primes connected to X may, may be on the verge of softening, or some of them. And then over here, in these, these sort of red areas, they're really firmly, X prime and the associated strain are firmly in this phase. So we could push these phases around, depending on where you are, using some dynamics, Newton's laws. Okay? That's, that's the idea. Okay? It's a very, very loose idea, and that, that's, the important, that's just the point I, I want to make here. So, so, so you can see that you can push things around. Um, now we're going to talk about the uh, proper scaling of the, of the potential and of the force with respect to the horizon, the non-locality. And there's a um, guidance, there's a principle behind how you scale this. Okay, so here, our particular force, I mean, we just mimic a, a convex concave uh, potential. We can mimic this. And this type of mimicking was done in image processing by uh, Massimo Gobino, uh, but it just, it just falls right into our lap here for this type of problem. Um, and so, but the scaling. What about the scaling? How are we choosing physically to understand the scaling here? What epsilon, what should I take? One over epsilon, one over epsilon squared. What's the motivation? Okay. Well, the motivation is, is we're interested in, 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 in seeing how things work for a finite horizon epsilon. So what we would like to do is, is we're going to look at a family of materials parameterized by epsilon such that the family has something in common. So uh, in periodic homogenization, it's the period and the period, the physics is the same and the period goes to zero. Here we're looking at a localization. And so we're based on localization, we're going to change, pick our epsilon. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick our epsilon such that this quantity here, which is the energy, and I'm going to show you, which is the energy required if you're at a point here and you draw a piece of plane there, you would like to ask yourself how much energy in this cap, uh, given a point in the cap, how much energy do I need to expend to eliminate any interaction between the point Y on this side of the plane to the point X on this side of the plane, okay? So what I would like to do is I would like to fail. So let's, let's take these two points here, uh, this point here, X and Y, and what I would like to do is understand how much energy is required to fail, uh, you know, bond. And that's the area under the curve. And that's given by the potential. And that's given by the uh, uh, asymptote of the potential. Okay? Now, if we take the asymptote of this potential to be 1 over epsilon, and basically what we do is, is we actually write this out. W infinity is actually F epsilon, which is, the, uh, which is a, a number divided by epsilon, that's W epsilon. This is the amount of energy required to fail uh, a bond between here and here. And now all we do is we add them all up, add up all these energies. We add up all the energies. So let me explain in, in, in more detail. I'll just draw a picture. I'm not sure how, hmm. I'm not sure how to uh, pause, pause this, but I will draw a picture and I'll really draw it solid so maybe maybe you can see so we have here our piece of surface we have a transverse <coughs> between them we have a, a point here we'll call Z or X let's call it X and what we're interested in is the paradynamic neighborhood which we'll draw it let's say like of, of diameter epsilon here like so, and then we have our, our point Y, and now we'd like to fail all the bonds between here and here. Now, what we see is, is that we have size epsilon here, then really, <coughs> we can actually go all the way out to here. We can move epsilon, well, no, that's not gonna work. I mean, maybe right there, okay, sorry. So this, is yeah, there we go. So this is, this is epsilon down. This is an epsilon down there. Okay. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to, in order to understand how much energy 
is required such that points on this side don't interact with all points on this side. We know that it's only for points uh, within an epsilon distance away, x's within an epsilon distance away that we need to care about because if you're down here or if you're down here, you'll, you're, you're not interacting with across that, across that uh, lay, uh, plane, piece of plane. So, so what you want to do is, is you realize that the only a width of epsilon is participating here in when we do our calculation for uh, calculating how much energy is required to, you know, for no, you know, to null out the interaction between bonds that are connecting points X to point Y. So we just look at that family of neighborhoods until we're here. Okay? Now, what I'd like to do, and then I do the same calculation on top. And I calculate that energy. Okay, G. I do that calculation. And I find that if I divide by epsilon, this value of G is the same for all epsilon. And that is going to characterize my family of, of, uh, of, of materials. Okay? So the thing that, that all of these have in common is that the energy it takes to separate two surfaces completely or remove interaction between them across a plane will be the same for every epsilon. Okay? So that's how we choose our scaling okay? based on this calculation. <coughs> now, one thing we can say already then is we have some opportunity for localization in the sense that, and again, these are very heuristic arguments, <coughs> but we have some opportunity for localization because <coughs> the amount of uh, volume or the amount, so this is the energy per unit length of surface, okay, or length of, uh, you know, surface here, or <coughs> uh, the amount participating in here will be a, of a, a diameter 2 epsilon. <coughs> So if we do have some sort of crack or some sort of uh, defect where, where one side of the plane is no longer interacting via forces to the other, <coughs> then that will uh, be of size epsilon. And so you could see as we shrink epsilon to zero, we get some sort of localization. This is a much smaller epsilon. So we see, at least at this level, it's at this energetic level, we, we are getting a, a localization of the forces required to separate and make surface. So that's, we can anticipate something. Okay? And so going into it, this is what we need to do. Okay? So, okay. so, so that's, that's, how we choose, um, that's how we choose this. That's how we choose our modeling, our models. All right. So now... Elastic is a different story. Okay, now we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, well, let me draw again. I'll just say, we're going to be looking at the vicinity but we go back to the stress-strain curve now. We're looking at something different now. We're going to be looking at in the neighborhood of here. This is stress. This is I mean, this is strain, this is force. We're looking in the neighborhood of here. Okay, so this is a, this is a force strain curve. Okay, so we're going to be looking in the neighborhood of here, and this really should be uh, link scale independent somehow. Or, 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 you know, whatever we find here, our elastic property should probably be classical elastic and not depending on. And so what we find is, is that, <laughs> we do a direct calculation, a direct calculation, and we find for our, if we assume for the moment that in our horizon that the uh, strain field is roughly homogeneous or linear, so our deformation or d displacement is a linear displacement, that is, is uh, it would be of this sort, I'll just write this up here. So if we assume for a moment that you, oops, that's, Daniel told me that would happen. Uh, that if, if this is u of x, this is our displacement, and it's a linear function of position, then s will be f, like I had here, e dot e. Okay? <coughs> so if, for example, in our paradynamic horizon, 
we have the fact that along these link scales that we have a, a linear deformation along the link scale of the paradynamic horizon. Then we can anticipate that our potential energy, our calculation shows that our potential energy to leading order is given by a quadratic energy in terms of the deformation, in, ter in terms of the strain. And then up to an error in, in the size of the so for small, you know, when, when the strains are, say, linear relative to the link scale of the interaction zone, then to leading order, our uh, bond energy, when we integrate it all up, is linear elastic. Okay, this is the linear elastic energy. Now, this is a two-point potential, meaning that we only are looking at interactions of two points and summing them up, and therefore we will automatically get, and this is the same for, for molecular dynamics, that the, uh, the shear and LeMay moduli are identical. Okay? And this depends on <coughs> the slope. Okay? It, it depends on, we, we, this actually will depend on, on, on locally, <coughs> this is our F function here. This is our potential function. <coughs> this is F infinity. And then this is the slope at zero. <coughs> the other, other pr uh, extractor toughness depended on F infinity. The slope depends on the F prime at zero. I'll say more about, about this thing in a minute, what, what that is. That's called an influence function. But anyway, it's, it's a moment of some, some function. Okay. All right. So now let us let us start. Let us start in earnest. So I, I kind of gave a uh, sort of a, an explanation for what you should be expect what what we bake into the model. And now, as mathematicians, we stand back and we do nothing more, and we we investigate and just see what the model tells us. Okay. So we did these first things to get some sort of a priori intuition into the model. Now we stand back and let the chips fall where they may and see where we go. So <laughs> we start very much like in classical mechanics. Well, we go, do apply classical mechanics. We start here <coughs> with the energy density. So at, at e each point, we have an energy associated with a strain field. And here, because it's a non-local model, it's the integral over all x primes of our bond energies. And we integrate over the... Then we take the energy density and we integrate it over D, the domain over which we're doing our dynamics. <coughs> and that will be the total energy, the total, if you will, elastic energy. And the reason I say elastic energy here, I said this was in the elastic zone, this is in the yielding zone, but all of these, there's nothing to say, uh, there's no damage here. So I'm relying on inertia to have, have these bonds to keep going. But there's nothing to say if we had cyclic loading, they could come back and, and, and heal. There's nothing. So there's no damage in this model. Okay, we can improve that. And it's sort of the end of the lecture. I'll talk about that. But for, for really dynamic, where you're, you're shocking the system and you're pulling hard, once you fail, you, you stay failed. You know, you're, you're, you continue to run. Uh, so, but if we were cyclically loading, then I would have to say at some point, this. This, these, these force versus strain curves are somehow, if we're getting damaged, they have to become weaker, okay? Less force per strain, okay? And we can do that, okay? <coughs> but but this, for this particular model, we're shocking the system, we're using inertia, you run out here, you stay out here, <coughs> okay? So that's how we, that's, that's how we interpret it. Okay? But that's interpretation. I'm just gonna give you the straight model, okay? It's just the mathematics. So we go ahead, and here's our elastic energy. Then here's the kinetic energy of the motion, integrated over D. <coughs> the externally applied energy, uh, due to body force only, okay? We'll assume boundary conditions are zero, okay? So we're not uh, pulling or putting any displacements on it. We're just uh, subjecting it to a, a body load. And so the externally applied energy is, 
is the work of uh, the, the um, displacement done against the load and together with our initial conditions for um, displacement and velocity. Okay, so we have a, and for the moment, we'll, we'll assume, for illustration, we'll assume that the initial um, displacement and velocity is independent, but of course, we can allow them to depend. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Okay, so then we have our uh, Lagrangian, the three terms, kinetic, potential, and energy applied to the system. We form an action integral. We take the principle of Leak's action, and we recover our Euler-Lagrange equation, which is basically given this by this, which is, it's the acceleration. Here is the elastic force, which is the gradient, or the, uh, excuse me, the derivative of the potential function with respect to the strain. So this is all classical formulation, except now we're doing non-local things. Okay? So this is our dynamics. <coughs> So it's easy to show. This is a, an equation in a Bonnock space. And so we'll assume that our, um, <coughs> we'll look for solutions that are twice continuous in time and in L2, which satisfy these initial conditions in L2. And you know, you're straightforward. You have a Lipschitz. This is a Lipschitz. You can show that this is a Lipschitz continuous right-hand side in L2 with the same Lipschitz constant for any function in L2. <coughs> And so it has a, a, a solution. So it's, it's very nice, it's very easy, very straightforward. And um, since we do have that the force is a function of this type of uh, difference quotient type strain, we, could, we, we, we have a generalized directional derivative, so both smooth and discontinuous deformation can participate in the dynamics. <coughs> um, so, so I'll just finish. So, so we, we actually have a well-posed uh, problem. Yes? Yeah, yeah, that was, so that was, um, I'll draw a picture. <coughs> uh, so um, this, this would be our, our domain, D, bounded domain, and then X, Epsilon, and then H, X of Epsilon. And, and in doing so, I should also say I surround this with a layer, okay, a, 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 of, of, of size, say, uh, 2 Epsilon. And I ask that U, this is my boundary condition, equals 0. U, X equals 0 for X in here. So, so you do have non-local, you know, but you do ask that you, you have a, a non-local boundary condition as well. So instead of prescribing u to be zero on, on this uh, boundary, <laughs> you ask that u be zero in a layer, okay? And then, and then everything manifests, is, is, is okay. So um, let us examine then, th now we have our model, okay, it's well posed. Let's examine it as a function of epsilon. So the first thing I, I should point out, uh, let me rise this up again, is that each bond here is characterized by um, a couple different things. First thing is a, a, a sort of a, a surface energy that participates in the uh, G, in the uh, fracture toughness. Uh, a first derivative, which participates uh, in the elastic properties. And a, what I call, a strength. A value of the function <laughs> for which it begins to weaken, a, a, a critical force. And so that would be called the strength. <coughs> and this is R here. Okay? <coughs> and R, if you will, if we look at the potential, <coughs> is the inflection point of the potential. 
And the, okay. So we also have strength here. Okay. And we, we'll be using that very shortly. <coughs> so, um, so here, here we have our, 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 our neighborhood. Okay, and so uh, the, the, the fundamental unit of, 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 uh, of these non-local models is the neighborhood. That's the currency of the model. And so uh, what we are looking to be to do is, is uh, we're, we're interested in collections of point X's, X together with their neighborhoods. Okay, and, and then we examine uh, X connected to Y, neighboring points Y inside, and we look at the state of the of the of the force connecting between those two points for a given deformation. And uh, what we say is, is we will measure the proportion of the bonds, say 50% or, or 30%, for which uh, Y connected to X here um, have uh, strains that are bigger than the softening value, so that you're in this state over here. So the nice thing is, is when your strain is over here, you're softening. So that is, is when you're bigger than this divided by that, you're softening. Now here, we are saying, we look at each, each bond in the neighborhood at a time. So if we have a point X prime, we have our potential, <coughs> which is a function of uh, the, you know, the bond that is this far away from X. Okay, so it's a radial dependence. And we see softening. Okay, so for each X prime, we look at the force. Okay, and the force is in terms of each x prime. Okay, and so we ask ourselves, let us let us do some uh, diagnostics. So we have a flow, and let's take a snapshot in time, and do some diagnostics, and ask what percent of the bonds are uh, greater than the softening value. Okay, what percent of the x primes and x's are greater than the softening value? And let's call that alpha. That that we can call the process zone. Okay, and so the dynamics selects the process sum. Okay, this is something that is convected or, or carried in the dynamics, <coughs> not convected, but, but carried in the dynamics. And so in some, in a point in the process zone, in this neighborhood here, the, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the bonds are in this phase. In points that are outside it, none of the bonds are in that phase. Okay, or, or, or less of a percentage are in that phase. Okay, so that's how we, we d d d say a process zone in the sense that something nonlinear is occurring here. It's softening. So these are the predominantly softening areas, and outside here, the predominantly not softening areas. <coughs> now, <coughs> what, is, what is special about these softening areas? Well, instability is, is special. So if we're in a neighborhood, for example, centered at X, and we have a defect, say a jump perturbation where you have a uh, displacement which is actually, um, let's say, uh, you know, it looks like this. So this is you left and you right. <coughs> you right. And, and that'll be you left. Let me write this up bigger so you see. So we'll, I'll, I'll do this better. <coughs> Suppose on one side of the um, neighborhood, <coughs> you have one deformation state. And on the other one, you have another deformation state. And these deformation states <coughs> this is the jump, delta t. OK? So on, either, on one side, we have uh, one and then we jump up over here. We jump up over here. And so this is a typical neighborhood. And suppose we have that. The question is, is uh, given a smooth equilibrium solution, <laughs> is it stable under a jump perturbation? And so we do a formal calculation and <coughs> we, we find that we get an ODE for this and this is the stability uh, matrix. And we find that, this is a cartoon, again, this is an informal calculation, but we find that when the predominantly, when these guys, when this guy, delta S, is unstable, that's when 
we have S bigger than is softening. Okay, so we have the bond is softening, and we also have that the second derivative is negative, is unstable. So it, sh it should be that way, and it, and it is. <coughs> Conversely, if we're below that uh, softening value, then we are stable. And from the stability analysis, we can see that if the uh, uh, majority of bonds are unstable, then we get a, a, an unstable growth in our, in our jump perturbation. When the majority bonds are such that this integral has a, 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 a uh, I'm going to say a, a negative sign, then, which is, occurs here, then we get a, a neutrally stable. Okay? So go either way. But we see r straight away there is a definite connection between our second derivative and stability of jump perturbations. Okay, so it's interesting to keep an eye on these. I'm going to show you some other perturbations as well uh, in, in the next couple lectures. But uh, this always continues to, to raise, and, and it is related to the, insta to the dynamic instability, which, you, which we know is true in, uh, for other a areas of continuum mechanics. And so the question is, what happens to these zones of dynamic instability? Do they concentrate? Well, you can do a simple energy balance, and you can find the following, that, that in fact, these places where small nu fissures can nucleate or, or existing ones can grow further um, exists in, the, in, these, in this collection of neighborhood which are, are unstable or have a certain number of so soft bonds. Okay? And, and so basically, you can, you can do an accounting. This is the energy put into the system up to time t. This is the diameter of the uh, horizon. This is the volume of, of, of the centers of the centroids. And then this is the strength of the bond. And this is the number of bonds uh, for which you're uh, in the softening regime. You have force bigger than that. Then, then you get this inequality, okay? And you can do this directly from the, the uh, ma uh, Grunwald's inequality. So you can, you, can, you can prove this mathematically from Grunwald's inequality. So we see that as the link scale goes to zero of the non-local interaction, we are concentrating or, sh or making the volume of the, this zone where you have unstable bonds smaller, okay? So we see some if you will, concentration. Now, this is a crude measure of concentration. It's, it's Lebesgue measure, but, but still, it, it shows that the volume is, is decreasing as epsilon goes to zero. Um, what we'll do is, is actually, what is typically done is we, we threshold things, and we'll say, for example, anything with alpha bigger than one-half is a, is a fracture. Okay, that's, that's again heuristic, okay? That's not rigorous, but if you were doing a numerical anal analysis, you would say, okay, those things I'll show you in the, in the modeling is, is, um, it co consists of a fracture. So this is, this is how we get it gauge our, our size of this place where there's dynamics instability. It gets smaller and smaller as the non-local horizon gets smaller. And again, this is a consequence of uh, a Grunwald inequality for the dynamics, so the kinetic plus the elastic energy has to be less than the energy put into the system. And from our assumption on fracture toughness, uh, our, our, uh, it's much more costly to have unstable bonds. Therefore, if you're going to be finite, you better do it over less of your domain. <laughs> OK, so now let's take uh, the limit. Uh, let's see, am I? I'm closing in. Okay, we're we're doing okay. So so um, let's take the limit of vanishing. That is, as epsilon goes to zero now, we know heuristically that that we should see some kind of concentration. Um, so let's take the limit of this dynamics <laughs> as epsilon goes to zero <laughs> for these particular rescaled potentials and these solutions. <coughs> with these given initial data in zero boundary conditions. So we'll start with the non-local uh, dynamics associated with a fixed horizon scale, and then we'll pass to the limit as epsilon goes to zero in the dynamics, <coughs> and then we'll recover a sharp dynamics associated with a PDE-based evolution, okay, describing brittle fracture. Well, this, is, this is sort of like archaeology. You just see what, what happens. 
<coughs> we don't we don't answer all the questions, but we 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 answer some of them. So what we find is is we have a, a bounded initial data, and suppose our initial data, uh, our initial velocity and displacements are are bounded uh, in in x in in the domain. Then we introduce a linear elastic fracture mechanics energy, and here you know we'll, we'll ultimately introduce a class of functions called special functions of bounded deformation and I'll do that in great detail tomorrow but I, I'll initially say that these are, are uh, functions such that uh, their strain this is the tr traditional elastic strain uh, which in, in is is square integrable and and this is the elastic energy the shear energy of the material this is sort of the, 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 the volume change energy here. And, and, and so this, this is the uh, a lambda. This is the mu. And then this is the fracture toughness, that object that we were talking about before. And this is uh, the Hausdorff dimension or the surface measure of the jump set of these deformations. So these U's can be smooth away from uh, sets of co-dimension one smaller so if it's a volume it's an area or if it's a two-dimensional problem it's a it's a line uh, a, a, a curve and <coughs> G multiplies this is the length of the jump set of U. this is the length of the jump set or the surface area of the jump set in three dimensions multiplied by the fracture toughness and these are the elastic properties so the linear elastic fracture mechanics energy has two contributions a bulk energy contribution and a surface energy contribution. Okay. Now, the surface energy contribution, G, what G is showing up there is precisely this G, the one I calculated before. Okay, that's the G we're going to use. And <coughs> the um, <coughs> mu and lambda that show up there in the linear elastic fracture mechanics, again, is given by this formula. Okay. So those are the those. Are, so the, the original calculation was was done, you know. So then, <coughs> what we can say we have actually have a nice compactness theorem <coughs> for the dynamics, uh, which basically says any cluster point of uh, the sequence. So now imagine taking epsilon to zero. As you take epsilon to zero, you get a family of solutions to the cohesive or the, the this dynamics, and. <coughs> That that sequence of solutions uh, could have cluster points, okay, uh, in some metric, okay. And in particular, let us suppose, um, you know, basically, it, it, it first off there is compactness, so it does have a cluster point, at least one cluster point, u zero, okay, such that these u epsilons, a subsequence, <coughs> uh, is converging to this cluster point. So there exists one, at least one cluster point where the cluster point uh, has bounded elastic fracture mechanics energy. So this u naught cluster point has a jump set, which is bounded. And it has uh, these distributional, or if you will, these, these derivatives, the volume change derivative, and sort of the uh, shear part, the shape change derivative. <coughs> and we have a sort of a uniform in time <coughs> a convergence, okay? So in particular, we, we could have many cluster points, you know, of, but we just pick one. There exists at least one, which has bounded energy in linear elastic fracture mechanics, and for which we converge uniformly in time, L2, okay? And this guy is in this uh, weak space, actually, for almost every time, it takes values in uh, special functions of bounded deformation, and I'll explain more what that is. But the fact that it takes values in this space tells us something about the jump set. I mean, it tells you volumes about the jump set. And um, this space was uh, 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 fine. Pro uh, this space was originally developed by Pierre Souquet for the purposes, well, not SBD, but bounded deformation, was developed by uh, Pierre Souquet for for plasticity, and uh, and I mean I may have this all wrong because this was a while back, and also Roger Tamam, you know, continued and Gil Strang and 
and many others. And then SBD, I'll probably get this not completely right, but uh, uh, Ambrosia, uh, Dalmezo, and uh, Cosica. And I, I know there's an, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it correct in a minute. I have, I have all the references. Uh, and then more recently, uh, Ambrosio and Dalmezo uh, spoke more about, uh, as did uh, uh, the, the fine properties of SBD. Actually, Dalmezo and, and uh, I'll, get the, I'll get the references pr proper, but, but basically fine properties of SBD, special functions of bounded deformation or functions of bounded deformation, which have nice, which have, uh, jump sets, but they don't have what is called a canter part. Oh, that's uh, uh, something that's nice and is useful. So this, this corresponds to your notion of fr jumps, okay, and cracks, but it also says something about the geometry of the cracks predicted by this paradynamic model, <laughs> okay? So I'll go into that a little bit more. So anyway, there we go. We have a localization. Um, <laughs> now we'll talk a little bit about energy inequalities and equalities. So for the paradigm, for the uh, non-local model, the non-local evolution, the total energy at time t is the sum of the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the work done on the body. And the initial energy is the initial kinetic energy, the initial potential energy of the of the uh, uh, displacement, and and the initial work. And we have at every time this equality, okay? Very easy to do. <coughs> Similarly, for the limit evolution, now we'll have a energy inequality in terms of linear elastic fracture mechanics, okay? And, um, oh, okay, well this is, this should be a, okay, this is actually was done uh, for anti-plane shear, <laughs> and so we're actually in SBV here. This is a scalar field, but, but we could have the same linear elastic fracture mechanics energy we had before um, at time t of the limit flow, work done by the body, the kinetic energy, and so this is the total energy at time t for the limit flow, the initial energy for the limit flow, and we get a limit flow energy inequality. And this agrees with the second law of thermodynamics, so this is, this is okay. Question is, is where does the energy go? Okay, I don't know yet. I don't know. Okay. <coughs> So finally, away from the crack set, away from the crack set, um, we have a th nice theorem that says that um, if, you know, for every epsilon you're never softening, then um, you actually go to the limit flow then. If you know that extra piece of information, then the limit flow actually solves the uh, a linear elastic wave equation. Okay, a classic wave equation where now the stress is uh, a, a multiple of the identity, which is the trace, that's the divergence, the shape changing part, or the, the volume changing part, plus predominantly the shape changing part, the strain. And um, so that's outside the process zone. Um, as epsilon goes to zero then, we notice again that we have our limit, a cluster point, characterized by displacement, and then our jump set. That should be a J there, not an S, a J there. Okay, so, so we see that the, uh, this, this type of energy is, in, is encouraging. It actually goes to a, a, a sharp interface model. And again, all of these uh, uh, constants appearing in the uh, wave equation for the sharp interface model are precisely the constants we calculated, okay? <laughs> and last, I, I just finish up with a, um, a simulation uh, using the paradynamic model. So that's the model with finite epsilon. So we're using a finite, so the idea here is, is we'll always be using a finite epsilon model to compute with. And the idea here is we don't have a phase field, we just have the deformation field. And we threshold, okay? So this is, this is heuristic in some ways because what we'll do is we'll take Z here to be the ratio of the actual strain because we can always measure, we're doing computations, <laughs> and it's the ratio of how much the, the magnitude of the strain divided by the critical strain for which it softens, 
Okay, and so here I have domains C less than L1, which means up here you're 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 you know you don't have too many, or, or actually the ratio you have nothing that's softening. Here <coughs> you have the borderline case where you're right at softening, and here at these right near the crack you're very much softening. You have 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 bonds that are very much softening. So we threshold. Okay, and we just and the black is is the bonds that are very much softening. So we threshold, and what we find because we built it into the model is that the release in paradynamic surface energy, that is the energy required to separate two um, sides of the surface, up to you know some error, is exactly is is exactly the Griffith energy. But the important thing is is as we pull, we we simply Actually, we have an initial uh, uh, data, and we pull equally with a given velocity on either sides. We have a notch, and so it starts. The crack starts, and um, the 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 key is is that um, the energy required to eliminate interaction from this side to this side and this side to this side remains the same throughout the flow. And the development of the crack is 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 um, symmetric as it should be because we have we're, we're pulling the same on left and right, and so we get a check of this numerical method. Um, I'll show you though that uh, in the next in the last lecture that the elastic properties that we use in this method, um, the potential we took was was a, a two parameter exponential potential, and for this model and it. That does not get the elastic properties correct, okay? And we learned this through comparing with experiment in, in uh, and I had the privilege of working with Mark Patrick Deal and Mark Alex Schweitzer, and we, we saw that we couldn't get experimental results, um, the experimentally determined uh, elastic properties for a particular physical system using the potential we used here, because we had to use some formula for our potential. We couldn't write W, you know, we couldn't write a partial derivative s of w epsilon everywhere. We had to write down a a particular concave, you know, concave convex potential or a softening. We had to do something, and we found that we didn't have enough parameters. Okay, but uh, and it didn't work for PMMA. Okay, so this is where experiments are helpful. You know, we can we 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 otherwise we could, we, we could do exponential models all all along and and publish papers, but realize in the end of the day, it wasn't going to work uh, with experiment. So that that's a, was an interesting lesson. However, you know each each thing does give you something. So we do have the constant energy release rate, the energy required to separate either surface, with this, as we see, saw in the calculation. Um, this is. Just for show, um, it, it, we, we pull on it really hard and it cracks. Uh, here, it um, again, we threshold. We really don't have a crack. This is just where the ratio of a family of bonds inside a horizon, these are the centers of all the horizons for which a family, um, a, a subset of bonds is greater than, um, I think, just actually Z bigger than 1. Is the, is the level set here? So the collection of horizons centers for which z is bigger than one, as we pulled on this. So it started here. This is a stress concentration. We needed a stress concentration to initiate the crack, and then the crack went. Okay. Uh, one thing I'd like to do in closing is is just some basic inequalities between paradynamics and linear elastic fracture mechanics. Um, <coughs> this is the paradynamic potential here, and we wrote down its explicit formula, but we actually have <coughs> a very nice inequality that says that the paradynamic potential is strictly bounded or bounded above by the linear elastic fracture mechanics potential. So if you have a deformation that has a jump part to it, then its paradynamic energy is bounded above by the linear elastic fracture mechanics energy where these mu's and lambdas and g's are calculated accordingly. Okay? And this follows from the local inequality, which basically is a dichotomy, is the Griffith dichotomy. This here is the energy associated with an elastic potential. 
this is the energy for a given uh, bond associated with the uh, potential for creating surface area. And in this way, we see we have a double well potential. We have a potential at zero and a potential at infinity. And this is the local inequality. And this, when you build a, 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 your, your gamma converging sequence, you use this inequality all along. And this also shows up in image processing uh, as, as in, uh, I, it, you know, as in Gabino and, and then the other work of, uh, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll figure, I'll remember in a second. So this, uh, but the key, the cool part is, is that we have an upper inequality. This is the Griffith fracture dichotomy. And at the same time, this is the paradynamic potential. Okay. So I, I want to show that now and I will return to these things. Uh, in subsequent lectures. <coughs> so just to conclude, <coughs> we have a well-posed evolution. Uh, you could think of it as a free process zone model. This, these phases can move around as they see fit according to Newton's laws. Um, <coughs> we have a single equation of motion. We don't have an extra phase field. Um, we can get a priori estimates for the size of the process zone as as epsilon goes to zero, less and less is uh, less and less points or neighborhoods are involved in creating new surface. So you can think of these as being more brittle. As epsilon goes to zero, uh, as when epsilon goes to zero, then we actually get a sharp interface limit. Uh, it is more or less an application of gamma convergence. Actually, we parse it a little bit finer than that. Uh, into a, a compactness result and then a um, higher regularity result. Uh, but if you put everybody together and package it, then you can get a gamma convergence. Um, the limit displacement saves the, uh, satisfies the wave equation away from the fracture set. Uh, the fracture is confined in the limit to a, a set of finite length uh, given by countably rectifiable sets uh, with bounded, uh, bounded surface area. Uh, some articles on this, the theory, you can find everything I spoke on today, uh, complete with all the proofs, all the uh, proofs of everything uh, in, in, these, in these papers. And then more recently, I'll talk about the third lecture, is the, the numerical analysis uh, for a different kind of, slightly different kind of, uh, it's the same functional, but it's posed over a different space, space of uh, functions that don't have jumps, but in the end, uh, they, uh, the limit, again, does have a jump. Uh, and um, then the simulation with Patrick Deal, uh, correlating uh, elastic properties. And then the uh, fracture, uh, uh, the Griffith there, the constant Griffith energy release rate there, simulation. So we'll, we'll pick up tomorrow, and I will go more deeply into the mathematics of multiscaling and show you <coughs> briefly um, <coughs> the, uh, the weak convergence and the, the gamma convergence, but unfortunately a very light showing of it because we don't have much time. But I'll just show you what's involved. And then the third lecture will talk exclusively about numerical analysis and how to get convergence rates for finite difference approximations in space and time <coughs> for the dynamic problems. And we'll also say we, ha we, we are working in the presence of instabilities, so time stepping becomes a problem. And I want to talk briefly about <coughs> choice of proper time step depending on the, uh, so, you know, the uh, second derivative of the potential. So thank you very much. <laughs>